The first thing I really want to say, which I think is most important about today, and as we talk about dreaming for 2024, is I hope that everybody in here is dreaming for a Super Bowl win on February 11th. We got to start with that. No, but, but it's, it's, it's exciting to, to really celebrate another year of the Dream Keeper Initiative and all the work that has taken place under those resources. It is really unprecedented for San Francisco, that level of investment in the black community, and we won't be apologetic about saying the black community. And for us to be able to continue to provide that investment year after year since 2020, it is something that everyone needs to understand the magnitude of. And we all need to be in lockstep together to make sure that we can maintain those resources as we continue to move to the future. So as we talk about what we want to do in 2024, what we dream about, expectations, really make sure and understand that this unprecedented investment is not automatic. It's not something that is automatically going to keep coming to community if community doesn't stick together and fight together. So I want to make sure that we all understand that collectively as we move forward. As you do the work in community, with the resources that you receive, as you work with other organizations, other community groups, understand that without that tight fist, we're going to be in trouble. We are under attack as black people in this city. We are under attack as black people in general. And our only power right now is the power of unity. So that's right. Our only, that's the only way. But I do, again, just want to thank, of course, the Human Rights Commission under the leadership of Dr. Cheryl Davis. I want to thank, yes, yeah, give her a hand. I want to thank, of course, Dr. Saida Leate Tufu Birch. And, and really the entire Human Rights Commission team, the mayor's office, uh, my colleagues who have continued to support this investment. We want to make sure that we all understand that we've been working together collectively to realize this vision and realize this support and these resources and get them in to the hands of community. So thank you all for being your best selves. Thank you all for the work that you've done and for what you're going to continue to do going into 2024. Let's keep working together. Let's keep banging. And as I've said before, like the coach John Wooden from UCLA said, just imagine, just imagine all the great work we could do together if no one was concerned about who gets the credit. Let's bang. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, at least this front row, they sound Saida louder than the rest of y'all. You say, y'all like, look, um, oh, Dr. Scott over here, like I'm in church on oh, Easter Sunday. Say your speech again. We didn't hear you the first time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I, I just want to first and foremost thank all of you who are still in here because I know after you, I know you, you were looking for Thanksgiving dinner and you just got like the leftovers. That's okay. I want to thank you all for still being in space with us today, um, for being here right now. I am always grateful um, for the person that's coming up next and um, when we were watching the video and talking about alimony i was like oh that's your that's your stomping grounds that's where you was like doing the real 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 work right um and she continues to do the real work um and so as we get ready to move through this work through this day and we're having these conversations about um the power of unity the power of community the power of voice um, and how we do all of that work um, when she was doing work with the Domestic Workers Alliance and was like advocating and helping people be empowered to speak up for themselves. Um, I didn't say giving people power, like empowered and empowering themselves to recognize the power that they have and then we have our collective power um, and then went on to do other amazing work. But what I'm most excited about is the work that Alicia Garza is doing. Now give it up for Alicia Garza. <laughs> The work that she is doing now is most critical. And so when we hear stats that say, you know, 100,000 
um, folks are doing this work, but only 425 of them are black. Like we need that data to make the case. When we talk about, uh, we've gone from 14% of land to less than 1.2% of land, like we need that data to be able to do the work that we need to do in terms of like collective power. And so too often we get only locked into the qualitative story. We get locked into telling our stories, but we need to also be able to say we dis disproportionately have too many black people telling the same stories of bias, discrimination, of poverty, of incarceration, of humiliation, of mental stress, and that's the work that she is doing. So I wanna thank her because she could be anywhere literally in the world, and she chose to take time out to be here with us today in San Francisco. So next up is Alicia Garza, thank you. Now, I, I want to say the last time, I feel like the last time I was on stage with her, we had, I, I like had to come out of character and be like, you got me messed up, sit yes, down. I was just, I was just, I was just remembering that. <laughs> I didn't say it to her though, it uh -uh. was somebody else. Cheryl was ready though. <laughs> Cheryl was like, you're not going to play with me <laughs> on today or, or any, any day. other day. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> some of y'all don't know, but you will find out. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> Period. Period. <laughs> um, I am just, look, look, some people are like, it's true. Uh, yeah. Um, when we were thinking and planning about this day and about dreaming forward and really pushing the boundaries around like what we accept and what we, we, we take, um, there's a piece of this that is, you know, around organizing yeah. and what it takes to really be an organizer. And so often I think folks don't realize, right, like the evolution of organizing, whether it is you putting all your little, uh, whether it's G.I. Joe, which some people may not know what that is, or um, your Barbies or your stuffed animals around and like playing the game, or whether it is about like, I'm going to organize my siblings and my cousins so we can do whatever it is that we want to do at the family reunion. Yep. Like there is a level of that, right, that we all experience. What was your like, oh, I'm, I'm ready to organize moment? Mm, I've had so many. Um, but I'll, I guess I'll just start off by saying, so we all have a collective definition because lots of people use words and we all mean different things. So organizing is really the process by which we build relationships with each other so that we can come together and fight for what we long for. Yeah, it's the process of building relationships with each other so that we can come together and fight for the things that we long for. And what I think is important about that understanding is that nowhere in there is there a dependence on goodwill? Because we understand, right, that there's lots of things that people should do, but there's things that make people do things. And organizing is a process that we use to make people do things. And we make people do things by activating our collective power and then enshrining that power either in laws, in legislation, in dollars, in institutions, right? We make rules that govern us. So we need the negotiation part where we're like, okay, are you gonna do this by goodwill? But then we also need the piece that's like, you gonna do this whether you want to or not, right? And both of those things have to go hand in hand. And I think for me, where I really learned about the power of organizing is in Bayview Hunters Point. <laughs> and really working with folks who knew each other, knew of each other, had been in community together for a long time, but like maybe didn't know a lot about what each other longed for, right? And when I say longed for, like the things that you think about when you're about to go to sleep and it's quiet and ain't nobody else around and can't judge you for it, right? Or the things that you wake up thinking about and then you gotta get to the rest of your day, but it's the things that keep going on and on in our minds. 
organizing for me and, and what I learned in Bayview is like just sitting with people and giving us permission to imagine together. Yes. Beyond the day to day, this is what I have to do every day, this is what I'm responsible for. If you could have it your way, how would you have it? And just really sitting with how uncomfortable that exercise is for people because we're never asked that. We never actually get to be asked like, well, if you could do it your way, how would you do it? We don't even get to be considered as experts, right, on how it should be done. So organizing really helps unlock all of that. And, um, you know, part of what is also important to me about organizing is it helps us understand in a different way how things work, right? For me, um, I remember when I first got into organizing, I had this perspective of like, well, if I could just make you want what I want, then we could get it done, Well, right? And then I would go to the Board of Supervisors and I was like, they don't want it to work like I want it to work <laughs> and ain't nobody budging, mm. right? And then I realized like, oh, they have a process that they're using to figure out how things are getting done. And that process, they'll let you watch it. But there's ways for you to be involved and it's actually not the public comment. Well, well. It's not, and trust me, I've been in those meetings. You need to say that long again. Long meetings. <laughs> it's not public comment where you're influencing how things are done. It's actually at the voting booth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can you, I just put a, yeah. as they say, put a pin there because I think folks need to realize a lot of times when you come to those meetings and you speak at public comment, decisions have already been made. Yeah, it's done. <laughs> that two minutes times a hundred doesn't always sway what's going to happen after you finish talking. It rarely sways it. <laughs> it rarely sways it because when you, public comment is just a law that they have to follow to make the final decision. But the decision's been made. They're just clicking down the clock to hear what you gotta say so they can say, okay, we heard what you had to say, but the decision was made three days ago, yeah. right? Just period. So the power that we have and the power that we exercise through organizing is deciding who gets to sit in that room and you decide who gets to sit in that room and you also decide what they do when they get in those rooms and what agenda that they're negotiating when they're not in those rooms and they're not with you. And you get to determine whether or not they get to keep sitting there over and over again. All right. That's a lot of power and it's a lot of power that we leave on the table. So organizing helps us reclaim that power and use it for the aims of <laughs> being able to govern ourselves in a real way. Give it up for all of that. So can you make, or do you think there is a distinction between, because as you're, you're talking and I, you know, thinking about movement building versus organizing, is there a difference? What is the difference? Um, because I think you've done movement building in the, so I, I wanna hear what you see as a, a distinction or if there is one. Um, well, I was so appreciative of the panel that came before us mm -hmm. and um, uh, our family who was talking about uh, how some pieces of our movements are seen as more important than others. Mm -hmm. And I just want to reiterate that we really do need all of it. Yes. Like we really do need all of it. And so I would say organizing is under the umbrella of movement building. And it's not about which one is, you know, they're, they, yeah, they're different things, but they are um, congruent. Yes. You have to have organizing to build a movement. Right. You have to have a movement that holds organizing in many places. And then there's a lot of other things underneath that umbrella. Um, there's electoral organizing, right? There's direct service. Mm -hmm. There's caregiving, right? There's like a lot of different things underneath that umbrella of movement building. And movement is really where you bring all those folks together who long for something and try to give it some direction. Yes. 
So connecting back, because you mentioned in the last panel, and one of the points that I think aligns with something you just said, but also with the panel where they talked about the creation of capital, right? Mm -hmm. And um, is there space in this movement building, and again, this is like freelancing, but just thinking about the last panel, thinking about what I've heard about the ability for black people, people of color, but specifically black people to build capital, because when startups start, they go first round to friends and family who invest, right? And that it's a different type of um, movement building or things that they have access to, and that as we're doing this work, we, we sometimes are so limited. And so our freedom dreaming, our ability to imagine beyond, is sometimes unfortunately limited by our resources, right? Like we, are, we find it hard to imagine beyond what we, we already have in hand. And so when we think about organizing, movement building, imagining things beyond, and then understanding that historically we haven't had access to the resources, does that come into play when we try to organize or build movements? Like we don't have the money for the signs or we don't have the money for the room to organize, to meet, to, like how does the, the resources impact even some of that? Well, it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. So. Um let me just start with this, which is, that's all designed. That's designed by rules and policies and laws. And even this distinction between public funding and private funding, the ways in which city governments, right, county governments are really now very dependent on seeking out private capital to close the gap in public funding Right, like all of that is designed and different places have different gaps. Okay, so just to say it, there's some cities, they're not having that conversation about we gotta find, we gotta find private funding to do things for the public good. They're really flush with cash. I mean, I'm sitting next to a, a mayor here. They could tell you that's the truth. And then there's other places, which mostly are populated by us, where they're like, we don't got it. So we gotta look for other ways to get it. And I think there's something to be said about asking ourselves, why is that? Why is that? Like, you pay taxes. Mm. You generate resources for the place that you live in and you should be able to get things back. And whether or not and in what formula you are getting things back, really depends on your political power in a place. Mm -hmm. Power, just for us to have a collective definition again, is the ability to make the rules and change the rules. Not just for yourself, well. but for everybody else. So when I say political power, right, I mean the ability to make the rules and change the rules around who represents you, where the money goes, where it doesn't go, and what's the story around where the money goes and where it doesn't go, right? That's political power, and the way we get that is through organizing. So I just wanted to connect those mm -hmm, mm -hmm. dots and also say um, that, yes, the reason that disproportionately black people, people of color, women, right, have a harder time gaining access to capital is generally because it's not under the umbrella of the thing that is supposed to be accountable to you. Private capital is accountable to itself. <laughs> so again, you're depending on somebody's goodwill. I have $3 billion and I'm feeling good today, so I think I might give you a little bit of that. But it's gonna, you're gonna have a high interest rate and you have all these right. things and you gotta really show me in half the time that you can do it because, you know, I don't believe in you. But you could also have that capital under the structures that are accountable to you. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to keep fighting for that piece. Like yeah. private capital is defunding government because they want power over how money flows. So you actually need to keep putting money into government because it is the thing that you have a lever of decision making around. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Now, lots of people will tell you, no, you don't want that because you don't want the government deciding what you can do and what you can't do. And I'm like, yeah, but you get to be a part of that. Right. You really do. 
according to the laws. That's changing because <laughs> they figured out that we figured it out. Right. So now they're like, actually, we don't want you to make those decisions. Right. So now next time you got to have this ID, that ID, you got to live here, you got to vote this many times so you can keep voting. I mean, right. it's like really a mess, but that's why they do that. Well, when you say that, like it just, I'm having flashbacks around um, voting rights, right? And the, the reversal, really, these yeah. trends that we're seeing, yeah. in the same way, the power of knowledge, right? These fights and, and battles about like what can be talked about or read in schools. Yeah. And what's unfortunate, and just again, this idea of like using your power for good or in these battles, what's unfortunate is that we're seeing with these school boards across the country, we're seeing with the, the somebody told me, actually Michael Blake was telling me that in terms of um, preparing for elections that people are using online gaming yeah. as a way to like drop in the chat and get people to think a certain way or to move a certain way, like, but the power is in the people who own or have access to the online gaming or who are creating those things. So, when we think about, because you've given, given us this great definition of power, like how do we like get power to be used for good? Like how do we help people who are kind of at this, like I'm hearing people talk about the election and like I'm just not gonna vote or I'm not gonna be, how do we get people to step into their power and just not be like, oh, that's just the way of the world? Mm. Oh, I have so many thoughts on this and I wanna say it in a way <laughs> I want to say it in a way where you can receive it. Because lots of times when we start talking about voting and black people, we get preachy. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And so I don't want to do that. So check me if I do. But I feel really strongly about this. Yeah. One of the proudest pieces of our lineage as black people is that we have refused to take our foot off their necks. It's one yeah. of the proudest lineage, like pieces of our lineage. Like we would not be here if we ever let the pressure off. Despite many, many attempts to get rid of us, push us aside, disappear us, all the things. I think the way, to answer your question directly, Cheryl, I think the way to use our power is to understand where it lies. Mm. I don't think voting is the answer to everything. All right. I think voting does a very particular thing in a very particular context. It's one piece that we need. I just don't think we can abandon it, mm. thinking that abstaining is the same as exercising power. Mm. Abstaining is sitting out. I won't participate. I will not engage. That's fine. We mistake that for like the boycotts Mm. They're different things. Yeah. Not engaging is not the same as a boycott with a political objective and a strategy. Boycotts were about starving mm -hmm. a system right. of its money to function yeah. so that people would come to the table and engage. Right. Right. Right? right. Abstaining is like, I don't have a political objective. I don't have a strategy on how we're gonna achieve that political objective. I'm just not going to buy into this. And that's okay if that's how you feel, but we have to be really clear about what's what. Yeah. When we participate, we keep our foots on their neck. Foots, feet. <laughs> and, and we shouldn't um, be, we shouldn't, we, let me say it differently. We need to be very clear about what participation does and what it doesn't do. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I don't care about political parties. I don't. I, I vote with them, but because I have an objective, I'm trying to create a terrain that I can fight on right. and get the things I need. We're in a context right now where even fighting back is criminalized. So if you abstain, you leave the space open for people who decide they want to fight back to be taken out. Mm. Participating also gives the rest of us cover yes. to keep fighting. Yes. So that's the second piece. 
The third piece is politics is not about friends, it's about interests. All right. I don't, you know, there are politicians that I like and have personal relationships with, but I like them because we have personal relationships, not because I like their politics and policies. And when it comes down to engaging about the rules that you make, I hope our friendship will carry us through the right. fight we finna have. Right. That's that's what sometimes about. it doesn't. Right. right. Right? And so when you vote, it's not about do I like this person? Mm. Would I have them over for dinner? Would I buy them a bottle of wine? Right. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. It's yeah. actually about can I get them to do the things I need them to do? And if they're not perfect or even good on all the things that I want, how do I exert my pressure and my power to make sure they know they better get to it? The only way that happens is through participation, yeah. literally. So let's look at numbers. It's a couple hundred million people in the United States. Maybe, maybe a little bit less than half participate. They're making laws all over the country to cut out people like you and me who participate because it benefits how power operates now. It literally does. Yeah. So when they tell you you got to have an ID and it's got to be this ID, not the ID you use to drive, but you got to now go get a new ID just ID. to vote, I need you to understand why they're doing that. Mm. Politics is a numbers game. Mm. You got 10 people total. If nine people vote, they're making decisions for all 10. That's right. If you got 10 people total and two people vote, they're making decisions for all 10. That's just how that game works. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about how it is that we build political power, we really have to keep asking ourselves, am I abstaining with a clear purpose? and outcome in mind, and will that outcome actually happen because right. I'm sitting out? I'm hearing a lot of things from people like, I'm not gonna vote because I'm mad about how the president is doing the things the president is doing. I'm like, I get it. I, I'm sick to my stomach about what this country does. Mm. Sick to my stomach, and sick to my stomach that like, I, you know, it, it represents me. Right. I promise you, me sitting out, if, if one of them loses, they're not gonna wake up the next day and go, man, I really should have done something different. <laughs> I really should have done something different. No. no, no. You have to do both things. You gotta get the person in that's gonna give you the best terrain to fight on. Mm. You pick who you wanna fight, not who you wanna be friends with. Mm. And then you also have to keep fighting them Right around the things that you care about, like war and militarism and genocide mm. and um, black land and sovereignty and food and healthcare and childcare and abortion rights and right. all the all things. The, yeah. But it, it requires engagement. Now, last thing I'll say, because I promised I wasn't gonna preach, <laughs> so I'm gonna slow it down. <laughs> the last piece of this is there's many ways to participate. There's many ways to participate. So if you feed people and that's what you do, keep doing that yeah. and do it well. Yeah. And maybe create a space when you're feeding people to ask people, are you gonna participate? What do you need to be able to participate? You need a ride, you got questions, you wanna talk about it. Let's talk about it over the food I'm providing for you. Right. If you're a caregiver, keep doing that, we need that. Everybody is not an organizer and everybody ain't gotta be right. with the bullhorn and the sign, but everybody has to participate right. for us part. to get somewhere together. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. I'm like, we're getting close to the end. I'm like, I have all these questions. So I will just say two things. One, I won't 
ask you to necessarily respond to because I want you to talk about Black Futures Lab and the power in that and the possibility of that. But I just wanted to p double back on your point around the friendship and politics and policy. And I think it's really hard for folks in San Francisco because it's so small. I know. And folks, oh, I remember him and her from this and that and people all, you know, everybody knows everybody's business. Yep. And you're making decisions based on a personal relationship Right. that has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day job and that influences and shows up and then people personalize about who's with who and who's not with, yep. right? And it's, I think it makes it very difficult yeah. to be effective because yeah. you're not fighting about the policies. You're fighting about like, well, when I was 12, she didn't share her ice cream. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, got, <laughs> I got lots to say about that. And I'll do it with the Black Futures Lab. Um, yeah. So, you know, one of the things I think on the first day of Black Futures Month that we need to grapple with as a community, right, is um, how do we deal with this dynamic of what happens when our people mm -hmm. get power? Yes. How do we deal with the dynamic of what happens when our people get power? So the reason I keep talking about engagement is this. Sometimes we're just really excited that our people are in there. Yeah. And we're excited because we're like, I know them, and they cool, and they from the block, and whatever, 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 whatever yeah. whatnot, whatnot. But that don't have nothing to do with the decisions that they're making when they get in those roles. And I really do mean this because we also have to understand that part of the design of government and that thing I talked about, public and private, means that private really does influence the public. And so when you get elected, it costs money. And then you need to keep generating money to keep getting elected. And that's just a thing that every single elected official is dealing with. Every one of them. Every single one, friend or foe, black or white. So then let's take it up a notch and say, um, private capital is always lobbying for their interests. They never sit it out. No. They don't ever sit it out. And I don't even have to name the companies, you name it. Any of them, they know land is available, they are taking people out to lunch, <laughs> they calling them on the phone, they texting them emojis and gifts and, <laughs> TikToks and all the things, they're building relationships. And then they cash in on those relationships when it's time to make a decision. We don't do that. We don't do that. We talking to people about the 49ers. You need to talk to these people about land use, <laughs> evictions, rent prices, mm. literally. And don't let people put you to sleep because they're from the block. The way that we build political capital is by holding people's feet to the fire no matter who they are. No matter who they are. So you see them at the McDonald's. Yeah, what's up, brother? So check this out. Um, the homie got evicted. I want to talk about that. We can talk about the Niners at another time. Our folks who are elected need to have the experience of always being run up the pole when they see us. Mm. That is where accountability comes from. And I don't mean it's always gotta be funky, right. but we need to get in a practice of like, no, when we engage, we are, we are speaking to each other within the role that you're playing. I just wanna say I was not ready for the truth today. I'm like, Lord Jesus. <laughs> That's the only way for us to have that level of political power that we're talking about, yeah. right? Otherwise, we get what we get. We get what we get. Private capital never abstains. They never sit it out. They never kick back and go, oh, well, that's the homie, so I don't even really want to talk about this part. No, we have real things happening, 
And frankly, every single one of us has heard that we gotta work twice as hard to get half as far, and our politicians should have to do the same with us. At the Black Futures Lab, I actually created an organization that is designed to be a political home for us, a place where we can win the rules that we need to live full and dignified lives. We talked about data, and the Black Census Project that we run is now the largest survey of black people in America right. ever done in American history. Ever done. There's no survey bigger than ours. And we are talking to black people in jail, out of jail, used to be in jail. We're talking to black folks everywhere from every demographic because we really want to have our finger on the pulse all the time of what we are dealing with every single day. And not just activists like me, regular people, regular people. And we don't just do it to understand, we do it for the service of organizing. Mm. So we can actually say with confidence, Oh, no, 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 we have talked to 200,000 black people across the country, and this is what folks are saying. And I can boil that down to a zip code. Mm. I can boil all that down to a zip code. I can say, let me tell you what black women between the ages of 35 and 45 in 94124 think about health care reform. Mm. Mm. That's a tool that we offer to us in the service of power building and we offer it for free. We have a policy institute where we train people on the system and how it works and how to be a policymaker, even if you're not elected. Any single one of us in here can write laws and get them passed. You ain't gotta wait on any of these people. You can really do this. You can do this. Yeah. So we have an eight month rigorous program wow. where you get training, mentorship, you write laws, you get them introduced, you get them into committees, and we can show you how to get them out of committee and get them to a decision maker's desk. And we've changed laws in three different states using this model, including California. All right. All right. And then we also do our own black voter mobilization work in states across the country. We have five places where we're focused, California, Georgia, North Carolina, Louisiana, and Wisconsin, and we hope to expand that. And the work that we're doing is focusing on people who only vote every so often, mm. black people, every so often. Wow. And we don't go to folks and say, you know why you need to vote? No, 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 we don't do that. We go and we just listen. Mm. What do you need? What are you dealing with? What happens in this neighborhood every day? What do you want to see from politics? And then we use the data, we use our conversations, right? Yeah. To inspire people to participate. And in doing that, I can tell you, we have been able to increase black voter turnout amongst people who only vote every so often by a lot. All right. Gwinnett County, during the midterms, we increased occasional black voter turnout by 2,100%. Just listening wow. to people and not leaving people behind because they have questions or because they're cynical or because they've been burned. We all got that, so let's sit down, have that conversation, and then say we can walk together. The other thing we do with the black census, which I forgot to say, is we develop a policy roadmap that we can organize around, mm. and it's called the Black Agenda. Um, we have a black economic agenda that's coming out in June okay. that's really designed around all the things that we heard from the black census and what people said they are dealing with and what people said they wanted. And then we can use that for policy fights in San Francisco. We can use it for policy fights in Pinol. We can use it for policy fights in Washington, D.C. But it's helpful for us to have something to be organized around. And so this is a tool that is for us and by us that we can tweak. We could throw it in the trash if we want to, but it's just a starting place for us to reimagine what could government look like if it was run by us, mm. if it was accountable to us, and what could our communities look like if we were the people making the rules. Give it up for Alicia Garza.
Yeah. 